Hello again and welcome to another episode of the Ominous Origins Podcast with me, Casey. Of course, this episode is still brought to you by the wonderful people over at MorbidlyBeautiful.com. Morbidly Beautiful is your one-stop shop for all things horror, content related from interviews, reviews, top ten lists, and everything in between. It's been a minute. Again, I know, I know, I told you I was going to be inconsistent. And now I'm watching my friend's bird once again. You may remember last year around this time I did the same thing. So you may hear some squawks and chirps and cheeps in the background. I'll do my best to edit it out, but every once in a while, he will scream like a woman being murdered. It's terrifying in the middle of the night. (sighs) Speaking of terrifying, let's talk about the end of the world. Now, for some of us, that can't come fast enough. Me being in that camp, but I digress. The four horsemen of the apocalypse are the first sign of said apocalypse. So let's just look into what those horsemen do what they mean, and how they can be brought about. This is the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. Ominous. Ominous. It is an adjective. Sounds like someone breathing. Ominous. Throughout history and civilization, the notion of the apocalypse has been a reoccurring theme in human history transcending cultures and religions. It represents the ultimate reckoning, a purification of the world through catastrophic means. Think, you know, the giant flood and Noah and all that. Among the most fascinating prophecies of the impending doom are the four horsemen of said apocalypse, as depicted in the Bible's book of Revelations. By understanding the legend and its various interpretations, it is possible to envision this end of the world prophecy and the crumbling of civilizations at the hands of war, famine, pestilence, and disease. Upon re-examining the book of revelations, could it be that we discover any kernel of truth within the religious mythology of the four horsemen of the apocalypse? The book of revelations begins with the New Testament, and it details a doomsday prophecy as written by John the Theologian of Patmos. Within a chapter recounting the story of Doomsday Revelations, the four horsemen of the apocalypse appear to bring about the destruction on Earth and decimate its population. This chapter is commonly interpreted as a period in history where wars, disease, and hunger would cause a significant portion of the Earth's population to perish, kinda like today to be honest. In the Bible, these hardships are described as horsemen riding in succession at the behest of Jesus himself in the form of the Lamb of God. This title comes from the Bible, John 1.29, where John the Baptist exclaims, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of this world. The chapter begins by describing a divine scroll held by God in his right hand and sealed with seven seals. Their opening and subsequent apocalypse would usher the second coming of Jesus. Each one of these seven seals represents a different aspect of the apocalypse. The first four seals related to the horsemen, the fifth released the martyrs' cries for God's wrath. Meanwhile, the sixth ushered in a series of cataclysmic natural disasters, and the seventh called forth the seven angelic trumpeters carrying seven vials of plagues and divine wrath which they would pour out into the sinful and the wicked. That's Jack in the background, I do apologize. He goes on rants, much like I do sometimes. And he just won't stop. It's usually 24-7. He doesn't stop talking. And that's fine. He's just there doing his thing. Try to ignore him. I promise he won't be here for the next episode because that's going to be in like a month or two. Ha ha ha. Anywho, within the prophecy, the Lamb of God opens the first four seals. And on doing so, summons forth one after another the four horsemen of the apocalypse, setting in motion the ferocious cleansing of the earth. There is a quote here from Revelation 6-2, and it says, And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he sat, that on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Throughout history, various sources often explain the first rider in various different ways, since his role is the only one not explicitly stated, while most interpreters agreed that the white rider symbolizes disease and pestilence, it wasn't always the usual claim. There is a widely attested description that places this white horseman as a metaphor for righteousness. In a world where sin is rampant, a righteous harbinger of justice and righteousness would seem a fitting purifier. 
in an apocalypse. The crown that was given unto him could signify the rule of justice above all or symbolize a truly just leader, if one can such exist. But the symbolism of disease and pestilence could still be the most plausible description. The aspect of a conqueror is cognate with sweeping of a major plague, and the crown would symbolize the ultimate rule of death above all else. But as time progressed, and by the time of the beginning of the 16th century, many have come to interpret the White Rider as the personification of the second coming of Christ, or even Christ himself. At the time of the major crisis and the break of Western Christianity with the reforms of Martin Luther, this came as a most logical and accepted explanation. The white color of the horse and the rider was quickly connected with divine purity and absence of sin, and the bow he carried the tool of divine punishment. Likewise, the white rider was interpreted as the Holy Spirit, pure and just. Another popular view is something much simpler. The white horseman could just be the personification of mass conquest, the passage relating to the rider that went forth conquering and to conquer could simply be that, a descent of a prophesied conqueror that will enslave the populace of earth. The next quote we have here is also from Revelation 6-4, and it says, And there went out another horse that was red, and powers was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from earth, and that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. The red horseman is widely connected with war, and you can understand why from that quote. The translation often correlates in the description, the horse is fiery red and the fire bears an upright sword in preparation for battle. The red color is thought to symbolize the fire and blood of warfare, and the rider's ability to make men kill one another clearly symbolizes constant and global warfare. War, as an apocalyptic aspect, was always present throughout time and is the most straightforward herald of death. In Matthew 24, 6, 7, Christ states, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, for nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. This quote clearly relates to the ever-present aspect of warfare as a symbol of the final revelation. Another interesting quote could also be adapted to the Red Horseman and warfare as the aspect of pure evil and the Antichrist. Quote, From the eternal sea he rises creating armies on either shore, turning man against his brother until man exists no more. The Red Horseman could also signify the sin of hatred and aggression as a contributing factor to the prophesied end of the world. And in a paradoxical turn of events, the Lamb of God releases the same aggression to smite the wicked with fire and sword. The prophecy of constant warfare that is supposed to descend on Earth is clearly described with a Red Rider having divine authority to take peace from the earth. Naturally, there is a quote attributed to the third horseman as well, and that is the black horseman of the apocalypse, and it comes from Revelation 6, 5, 6. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. I made that sound much more ominous than it actually sounded, but hey, that's drama. Another easily interpreted figure, the Black Horseman, was almost always universally described as the personification of famine. The horse's black color was widely attributed to the negative aspects, mourning, carrying ravens and night, desolation and bleakness, all of which are aspects of famine as well. The rider is said to carry in his hands a pair of balances. This is the chosen translation of the original word, the Greek word, zugon, which generally means a yoke, as in a burden and a yoke for oxen. Both descriptions carry negative connotations. The yoke is a synonymous with servitude and slavery, and the pair of scales signifies the rationing and measuring of food. This was the common ancient practice as describing a value to things. Once again, Jack is on a chirping spree. I do apologize, and I don't blame you for turning this off immediately because it is very fucking annoying and I have to live with it every day for the next three weeks or so. He just never stops. I love the bird, don't get me wrong. He's great, but he never shuts the fuck up. <sighs> I digress again, a little tangent here and there just to get my frustrations out, and it makes me feel more human, right? Because, you know, I just 
and my voice on the internet. So now you get to know a little bit about me and my troubles and my failures and my terrible, terrible life. Anyway, the passage states that a single penny would be sufficient to acquire only a meager ration of wheat and even less of barley. This is clearly an ancient view of what a famine would look like since wheat was a staple of the diet and without it bread was lost. The final part of the passage states that while the prices of wheat and barley are affected, the ones of oil and wine are not to be changed. This was interpreted in several different ways and could signify a paradoxical aspect in which the staples of food are gone while wine remains, furthering the famine while leaving the luxuries which cannot feed a man. One popular interpretation states that the black horseman signifies the imperial, ruling oppression of the lower class. The rich rulers hold these scales and dispense what meager rations they deem sufficient, while the luxuries remain abundant and out of reach for the poor. A growing divide between class and fellow men could be a perfect aspect of an end time revelation. Now we're up to the fourth and final horseman of the apocalypse, and of course he has yet another quote. This one comes from Revelation 6-8. And I looked and beheld a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and Hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth, to kill with a sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. That one was a little more epic. That's a quote most people are probably familiar with. If you've ever seen any movie really based on any sort of religious stuff. The fourth and final horseman serves as a sort of epilogue, a dramatic crescendo that culminates with the most powerful and feared rider of them all, death itself. In the entire chapter, he is the only rider who is named, and the only one without a weapon, for he himself is a weapon. The rider and the horse are depicted as pallid, bearing the sickly and lifeless color of a corpse and the ability to extinguish all manner of earthly life through various natural means. The Pale Rider contains elements of all preceding ones and could be termed the most significant of the four. In his wake follows Hell, the final culmination of all things horrific, seemingly ready to swallow all the wicked that will perish in the apocalypse. The part that states the power was given unto them over the fourth of the earth could be interpreted in various ways. While it could be that all four riders would wreak havoc over a quarter of the planet, it could also signify that each of the four would have a single quarter of the earth to rule. The passage states that the rider would kill within the beasts of the earth. This could be a hint to the animals and the nature that promptly retake the regions which are depopulated, signifying the ultimate reign of wild nature over man. The prophecy of the four horsemen of the apocalypse has long been the subject of inspiration for many artists who choose that influence and a critical subject as the source for their monumental artworks. Throughout time, many artists portrayed the four horsemen of the apocalypse in a way they interpreted them, which also provides good insight into the prophecy. One of the more popular depictions was made in 1887 by the renowned Russian painter Viktor Vasnetsov. A large painting, which I'm not going to try to say in Russian because I don't speak and I don't understand this language, is a colorful, detailed, and contemporary depiction of death, war, conquest, and famine. They are given modern attributes and were intended to reflect on the populace of the time. Some of the earlier medieval depictions were much more dramatic and almost unsettling, certainly aimed at putting fear into the more doubtful believers. One such depiction was made between 1496 and 1498 by Albrecht Dürer, the renowned artist of the German Renaissance. His dramatic woodcut representation of the four horsemen of the apocalypse is elderly, ghastly, and emaciated men who equally unsettling stallions are trampling the sinful and gluttonous people below. A similar woodcut was made in 1851 and 1860 by Julius Schnorr von Karelsfeld, a German painter who portrayed a savage and merciless massacre of sinners by the four riders, all under the watchful eye of the Lamb of God. To date, the story of the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse remains a stark vision of the paradoxical, inherent nature of man. From its earliest forms, it served as a warning for the wicked to change their ways, a plea for temperance and peace, for moderation and humility. Yet we see that in the 21st century, much of that description in the Book of Revelations and the tale of the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse has come to pass. 
from countless famines to plagues and pestilence to endless wars and decadence. The apocalypse seems to have occurred several times, or has it yet to come? That's a very good question posed at the end of this article here. The world in the way it is right this moment is a terrible, terrible place. How many of you struggle week to week, month to month, paycheck to paycheck, just to make rent? I know I do. It's terrifying to come at the end of the month and have $130 in your bank account to last you the next two weeks. And that is including after paying rent and all that stuff. So $130 does not go a long way in today's world. But I digress yet again, just another tangent. I don't want to dwell on this too much longer. I'm always going to be looking up in the sky to see if maybe, just maybe, there is a little horsey flying through the stars. And maybe, just maybe, I'll give him a wink and a nod, saying, hey bro, you got this. Anyway, that is going to bring us to the end of the episode today. My name is Casey, this is the Ominous Origins Podcast. If you like what you heard, and I don't think you did today because the fucking bird won't shut up, you can still leave a review on Spotify, or more of a rating anyway. A five-star rating would be awesome, but you don't have to do it, especially on this episode, because I just want to get something out there, though, because it's been a long time, it's been a few weeks, so I thought I'd throw something out there this week anyway, but... That is going to do it until next time.